Hello everyone. Today we are going to study the orbit. So this here is a frontal view of the skull and you can see the outline of the orbital margin and you can make out the orbital margin is almost quadrangular and it is formed in equal one thirds by one third by the frontal bone, one third by the frontal process of the maxilla and one third by the zygomatic bone. And actually the orbit is in the shape of a four sided pyramid with its apex somewhere here and it has a roof, a floor, a medial wall and a lateral wall. Now to look at the structures within the bony orbit we will look at an enlarged picture. See this is an enlarged view of the orbit and you can see the roof, floor, medial wall, lateral wall. Now in the roof you have the, the orbital margin is formed by the frontal bone and beyond that in the roof you have the orbital plate of the frontal bone. So this is the roof of the orbit and still beyond that you have the lesser wing of the sphenoid over here. So this is the roof, the frontal orbital plate of the frontal bone and the lesser wing of the sphenoid. Now in the lateral wall over here you have again the sphenoid but it is the greater wing of the sphenoid and the orbital surface of the zygomatic bone. So in the lateral wall you have a little bit of the orbital plate of the frontal bone but mostly it is greater wing of sphenoid and the orbital surface of the zygomatic bone. In the floor you have again in the orbital margin partly the zygomatic bone, partly the frontal process of the maxilla and in the floor you have the upper surface of the body of the maxilla in front and far behind close to the apex you have the orbital process of the palatine bone. What is most important is the medial wall. In the medial wall from anterior to posterior the orbital margin is formed partly by the frontal process of maxilla and partly by the frontal bone and anterior to posterior in the medial wall you have frontal process of maxilla behind it you have the lacrimal bone still behind it you have the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone and still behind it you have the body of the sphenoid bone so this entire thing is the medial wall so roof floor lateral wall medial wall and somewhere here between the optic canal and the body of the sphenoid this would be the apex of the orbit now in the roof of the orbit the most distinguishing feature is underneath the orbital plate of the frontal bone somewhere here you have the lacrimal fossa which lodges the lacrimal gland. Now we won't discuss the lacrimal gland with the orbit we will discuss it with the eyelids and the lacrimal apparatus. And somewhere here on the under surface of the orbital plate of the frontal bone you have the pulley for the superior oblique the attachment of the pulley of the superior oblique. Now if you come to the floor of the orbit, in the floor of the orbit you have this groove. This groove is called the infraorbital groove. Now this groove extends from this inferior orbital fissure. So you can make out that between the roof and the lateral wall you have the superior orbital fissure and between the lateral wall and the floor you have the inferior orbital fissure and the superior and inferior orbital fissures are more or less continuous. And extending from the inferior orbital fissure over here is the infraorbital groove. So you have the infraorbital groove here as well as the emergence of the zygomatic nerve over here. Now this infraorbital groove goes into the infraorbital canal and it comes out on the anterior surface of the skull as the infraorbital foramen. So infraorbital groove, infraorbital canal, infraorbital foramen and this gives passage to the infraorbital vessels and nerves. The infraorbital nerve is actually a continuation of the maxillary nerve and the infraorbital vessels are branches of the third part of the maxillary artery. So infraorbital vessels and nerve. Now if you look at the lateral wall over here formed partly by the greater wing of the sphenoid and partly by the orbital surface of the zygomatic bone just inside the orbital margin over here you have an elevation on the zygomatic bone which is called the Wittnall's tubercle and this Wittnall's tubercle gives attachment to the ligament of the lateral canthus of the eyelids and the lateral check ligament of the eyeball 
which is actually which are condensations of the orbital fascia now in the medial wall over here in the frontal process of the maxilla you have the anterior lacrimal crest and over the lacrimal bone you have the posterior lacrimal crest and between them over here you have the lacrimal fossa now in this lacrimal fossa you have the sac lacrimal sac which leads down to the nasolacrimal duct now this orbital plate of the ethmoidal bone the junction between the orbital between the ethmoid and the frontal bone and further medially junction between the ethmoid that is the junction actually between the medial wall and the roof of the orbit you have the openings of the anterior and posterior ethmoidal vessels and nerves that is you have the anterior and posterior ethmoidal canals and again when you go to the roof of the orbit between the lesser wing and the body of the sphenoid the lesser wing has got two roots between the two roots of the lesser wing you have the optic canal which gives passage to the optic nerve and the central artery of the retina so more or less you have covered the bony orbit except for the structures passing through the superior and inferior orbital fissures and not only that because this is the bone of the skull the bony orbit would be covered by periosteum that is the orbital periosteum and this orbital periosteum through the superior and inferior orbital fissures it would be continuous on the inside with the bone of the anterior cranial fossa and the bone of the pterygopalatine fossa over here so the periosteum of the orbits is continuous with the periosteum on the inner face of these bones not only that along the infra so this is the inferior orbital fissure and in the inferior orbital fissure this orbital periosteum is sustained and supported by some involuntary muscle fibers which are actually called the orbitalis so across the inferior orbital fissure along with the orbital periosteum and the orbital periorbita actually or the periorbital fascia you have some involuntary fibers of the orbitalis muscle so superior orbital fissure inferior orbital fissure and their connection over here we are going to see in the subsequent in this diagram so over here you can see a schematic of the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure which are more or less connected and you can see that just lateral to this just medial to the superior orbital fissure you have the optic canal where you have the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery and the ophthalmic artery is actually giving off the central artery of the retina which will enter into the optic nerve so again here you have the superior orbital fissure inferior orbital fissure optic canal when the optic nerve ophthalmic artery and the central artery of the retina so this ring that you can see spanning across the superior orbital fissure as well as the optic canal is the tendinous ring or annulus tendinous of zin which gives attachment to the four recti muscles of the eyeball the superior rectus inferior rectus medial rectus and the lateral rectus so this is the tendinous ring for attachment of the rectus muscles it spans across the superior orbital fissure and it encircles the optic canal as well now over here in the superior orbital fissure you can see that this fibrous ring has divided the superior orbital fissure into a lateral compartment an intermediate compartment and a medial compartment through the lateral compartment you can see the lacrimal nerve frontal nerve and the trochlear nerve now lacrimal and frontal are branches of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve the third branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve is the nasociliary nerve which is not in the lateral compartment it is in the intermediate compartment so lacrimal nerve frontal nerve trochlear nerve and superior ophthalmic vein in the lateral compartment apart from that you have the recurrent meningeal branch of the ophthalmic artery going recurrent meningeal branch of the lacrimal artery rather going back through the superior orbital fissure and Uh, connecting with the branch from the middle meningeal artery now in the intermediate compartment over here you have the upper division of the oculomotor nerve you have the lower division of the oculomotor nerve and the nasociliary nerve in between them and further down you have the abducens nerve so two divisions of the oculomotor nerve nasociliary nerve and abducens nerve in the intermediate compartment and in the medial compartment you have the inferior ophthalmic vein now this inferior ophthalmic vein may not be confined to the superior orbital fissure it may be multiple and once inferior ophthalmic vein may drain through the inferior orbital
again if you come to the inferior orbital fissure over here you can see that the most important structure passing through is the infraorbital nerve followed by the zygomatic nerve the infraorbital vessels and the inferior ophthalmic vein and as usual you have the tendinous ring the annulus tendinous it is bridging over the superior orbital fissure and the optic canal containing the optic nerve ophthalmic artery and the central artery of the retina now in this picture we are looking at extensions of the orbital periosteum so the orbital periosteum apart from being folded from the bony orbit outward into the skull the orbital periosteum gives prolongations into the eyelids as well as the orbital septum and these orbital septa are attached to the stiff tarsal plates within the eyelids so eyelids will discuss later but you can make out the margins of the upper and lower eyelids that is the palpebral fissure and you can see over here the upper eyelid has got a stiff tarsal plate lower eyelid has got a stiff tarsal plate and you can make out the aponeurosis of the levator palpebris superioris coming and joining with the superior tarsal plate and you can make out these fascial bands this capsulo palpebral fascia connecting the orbital septum to the inferior tarsal plates and you can make out thickenings of the orbital periosteum here forming the medial canthal tendon for anchoring the inner canthus lateral canthal tendon for anchoring the lateral canthus so this orbital periosteum at the margin of the orbit provides prolongations into the upper and lower eyelids as well now over here we are looking at the removal of the eyeball and the uh, remaining shell of the bulbar fascia or the fascia bulbi or the fascia of the eyeball so you can make out the eyeball is covered by a fascia it is enclosed by a fascia which is called the bulbar fascia and between the bulbar fascia and the eyeball there is some amount of loose areolar tissue within which the eyeball can slide and it can move and you can also see that all the muscles which are piercing this bulbar fascia and getting attached to the eyeball they are to some extent gaining fascial sheaths from the fascia bulbi you can see these small fascial sheaths encircling all these muscles and these veins arteries and nerves piercing the fascia bulbi going to and from the eyeball and so this is the outline of the fascia bulbi or bulbar fascia and you can make out that there are prolongations of the bulbar fascia here this is the medial check ligament and, and lateral check ligament so there are ligaments which are holding the eyeball along with the bulbar fascia in position and preventing displacement the medial and lateral check ligaments not only that these check ligaments are connected by a suspensory ligament like a hammer from below so here is the schematic you can see the fascia bulbi which is also called the tenon capsule and this bulbar fascia has given sheaths to all the extraocular muscles and from the sheaths of the medial rectus and the lateral rectus you have these prolongations the medial check ligament and the lateral check ligament the medial one attached to the frontal process of the maxilla lateral one attached to the orbital surface of the zygomatic bone over the vitnal's tubercle and between them you have this thickened hammock the suspensory ligament or ligament of lockwood although this part of the fascia bulbi is thickened and acts as a support for the eyeball the fascia bulbi is present all around the eyeball so it is a support through and through or uh, in spite of giving these projections to these extraocular muscles now if we begin the dissection of the orbit we usually cut out a triangular section from the roof that is from the orbital plate of the frontal bone and the a bridging portion from the lesser wing of the sphenoid that is we are opening up the superior orbital fissure so with a punch we have removed this portion of the lesser wing of the sphenoid and we have cut a triangular window into the roof of the orbit and we are going to dissect the orbit from above once you have removed the roof of the orbit you will find the orbital periosteum now this periosteum has also to be gently removed and cut in a triangular fashion and once you remove the periosteum just under the periosteum you can see this frontal nerve so you see from the ophthalmic division of the frontal nerve uh, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve you have the lacrimal nerve you have the frontal nerve and you have the nasociliary nerve of which the frontal nerve is the most superficial just underneath the periosteum you can see the frontal nerve lying over this levator palpebris superioris muscle and you can see the frontal nerve anteriorly has divided into a supraorbital and a supratrochlear nerves 
and they are going to exit the orbit and go out into the forehead and into the scalp. So the first nerve that you will be able to see is a very prominent frontal nerve. And apart from that you will be able to make out going towards the lateral wall over the lateral rectus this lacrimal nerve. So lacrimal and frontal nerves are immediately visible but the nasociliary nerve is going deep. It is going underneath this levator palpebri superioris and underneath the superior rectus and it is going deep over the optic nerve and crossing the orbit from lateral to medial. So the nasociliary you cannot see immediately but the lacrimal nerve and the frontal nerve you can see right now. Apart from that once you have de-roofed the superior orbital fissure you can see the trochlear nerve over here. So this very slender trochlear nerve it is going to the superior oblique muscle. So you know SO4, LR6 and other extraocular muscles are supplied by the oculomotor nerve. So superior oblique is supplied by the trochlear nerve and here you can see the very slender trochlear nerve. It is so delicate that it is frequently torn in a dissection of the orbit. In all dissections of the orbit you cannot see this beautifully displayed trochlear nerve. Sometimes it is there, sometimes it is ripped off along with the orbital periosteum also because this is a very delicate nerve. So at this point when you have removed the roof of the orbit you can see the levator palpebri superioris. Underneath it you can make out the superior rectus muscle. Laterally you can see the lateral rectus. Medially you can see the superior oblique. And if you separate it slightly with a hook then underneath it you can see the medial rectus. So superior oblique, medial rectus, levator palpebri superioris and superior rectus and lateral rectus over here and you can see the lacrimal gland in this corner just underneath the orbital margin and uh, just underneath the orbital plate of the frontal bone. So now next we are going to remove these two muscles and go deeper and go close to the eyeball and the optic nerve. Now in this picture you can make out the nerves entering the superior orbital fissure, you can make out the trigeminal nerve, you can make out the trigeminal ganglion over here. You can see the recurrent meningeal branch from the ophthalmic nerve going along the tentorium cerebelli. You can see the oculomotor nerve here but you cannot see it here because the oculomotor nerve has gone deeper. So you cannot see it in this section. You can see the trochlear nerve over here and can make out this thin trochlear nerve going inside the orbit. And over here you can make out the abducens nerve. Abducens nerve going to the lateral rectus but the abducens nerve is slightly deeper you cannot see the abducens nerve here but you will be able to see it on a deeper dissection and as usual you can see the cribriform plate of the ethmoid the beginning of the fax cerebri and the superior sagittal sinus you can see the optic chiasma the optic nerves and the optic tracts beyond the chiasma you can see the uh, pituitary stalk and you can see the diaphragm cellae and over here again you can make out the oculomotor nerve, the trochlear nerve and the abducent nerve and the trigeminal nerve. So oculomotor, trochlear piercing the roof of the cavernous sinus, abducent nerve slightly below going underneath the petrosphenoid ligament and the trigeminal nerve going into the Meckel's cave and expanding as the trigeminal ganglion. And on this side you can make out the greater superficial petrosal nerve and the meningeal branch of the mandibular nerve that is the nerva spinosus coming up through the foramen spinosa. Anyway, let us stick to the orbit. So in the next dissection, you can see a deeper display of the orbital structures. Why? Because for one thing, you have cut out the levator palpebri superioris and you have cut out the superior rectus. So levator palpebri superioris, superioris and superior rectus have been cut. Superior oblique has been cut to visualize the medial rectus below and over here the lateral rectus has been hooked outside. So you have hooked the lateral rectus, you have cut out a piece of the superior oblique and you have cut out a large piece of the levator palpebri superioris and the superior rectus. So in the previous diagram you could see the lacrimal nerve, you can still see the lacrimal nerve over here. You could see the frontal nerve here splitting into supraorbital and supratrochlear nerve. So lacrimal and frontal were here but you could not see the nasociliary nerve. So now you can see the nasociliary nerve, this is the nasociliary nerve. So you can see that nasociliary nerve over here and you can make out that the nasociliary nerve is passing over the optic nerve from lateral to medial. It is from the uh, superior orbital fissure through the intermediate compartment of superior orbital fissure.
it is crossing over the optic nerve and taking the medial wall of the orbit and you can see this nasociliary nerve it is giving the anterior ethmoidal nerve the posterior ethmoidal nerve and it is going anteriorly to end as the infratrochlear nerve so anterior ethmoidal posterior ethmoidal infratrochlear and on the way you can see this nasociliary nerve is supporting the ciliary ganglion over here so the ciliary ganglion then is between the optic nerve and the lateral rectus so this is the optic nerve this here is the lateral rectus so between the optic nerve and the lateral rectus you have the ciliary ganglion supported by the nasociliary nerve apart from that you can see this nasociliary nerve give a few long ciliary branches over here long ciliary nerves and although this nasociliary nerve is uh, is supporting the ciliary ganglion this ciliary ganglion is actually relaying fibers from the inferior division of the oculomotor nerve so here you can now see the oculomotor nerve also so when this was covered by superior rectus and levator palpebris superioris you could not see the nasociliary nerve you could not see this oculomotor nerve and you could not see this abducens nerve so abducens oculomotor and nasociliary they were all covered by the superior rectus and the levator palpebris superioris once you have cut these two and you have retracted the lateral rectus now you can see these three nasociliary nerve oculomotor nerve and abducens nerve now this nasociliary nerve again it supports the ciliary ganglion and from the ciliary ganglion you can see these short ciliary nerves but you can make out that this oculomotor nerve which is upper divisions which has been cut out because this upper division of the oculomotor nerve was actually supplying superior rectus and levator palpebris superioris so because you have cut out superior rectus and levator palpebris superioris invariably you have cut out the upper division of the oculomotor nerve as well now this lower division of the oculomotor nerves will supply the two lower muscles that is the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique and in addition it will supply the medial rectus so medial rectus inferior rectus and inferior oblique these three are supplied by the lower division of the oculomotor nerve and this nerve that is supplying the inferior oblique nerve to inferior oblique it feeds the ciliary ganglion with parasympathetic fibers so this parasympathetic fibers for the ciliary ganglion which gives the nerve supply through the short ciliary nerves to the sphincter pupillae and the ciliary muscles they are coming from the nerve to inferior oblique so now you can see the upper division of the oculomotor nerve cut out supplying superior rectus and levator palpebris superioris you can see the lower division of the oculomotor nerve supplying inferior rectus inferior oblique and medial rectus and from the nerve to inferior oblique you can see the parasympathetic relay to the ciliary ganglion which exits as the short ciliary nerves and of course you have seen the abducens nerve going into the lateral rectus so in these two pictures actually you have more or less a complete idea of the dissection of the orbit what you cannot see and what has been omitted in this diagram is that just as the nasociliary nerve crosses the ophthalmic the optic nerve from lateral to medial it is accompanied by the ophthalmic artery and the superior ophthalmic vein so these three structures nasociliary nerve superior ophthalmic vein and the ophthalmic artery all three cross the optic nerve from above so again nasociliary nerve ophthalmic artery and superior ophthalmic vein cross the optic nerve from above and this inferior division of the oculomotor nerve when it gives nerves to the medial rectus this nerve to medial rectus will also cross the optic nerve from below so these are the only structures which you cannot see you cannot see the ophthalmic artery over here it would make the picture more clumsy you cannot see the superior ophthalmic vein over here it would make the picture more clumsy and from below you cannot see the crossing of the nerve to medial rectus you see over here the nerve to medial rectus it has crossed below the optic nerve and it has gone to the medial rectus so all of this is there now in these two diagrams more or less you have a complete idea of the orbit now let us see what else is to be seen now here you have a schematic of the anterior view of the right orbit and you can see the beginning of the attachments of the extraocular muscles you can see that annulus tendineus of zin annulus tendineus communis that is the fibrous ring of origin of the extraocular muscles superior rectus inferior rectus medial rectus lateral rectus of which again you can see that this lateral rectus has got two heads and between these two heads you have the 
entry of the two roots, the two parts of the oculomotor nerve. So the upper division of the oculomotor nerve and the lower division of the oculomotor nerve, they are entering through the intermediate compartment of the superior orbital fissure between the two heads of origin of the lateral rectus muscle. And here again you can see that this upper division of the oculomotor nerve will supply these two muscles. It will supply superior rectus and levator palpebri superioris. And the lower division of the oculomotor nerve will supply the inferior rectus, inferior oblique and the nerve to medial rectus will cross below the eyeball and come below the optic nerve, below the optic nerve and it will come to the medial rectus. Apart from that you can see the trochlear nerve supplying the superior oblique and the abducens nerve supplying the lateral rectus and from the optic canal you can see the emergence of the optic nerve. So this is another schematic of the orbit. This is also a very good diagram and you can make out that just as these four recti muscles they have come from the tendinous ring the levator palpebri superioris and the superior oblique muscles they are attached to the lesser wing of the sphenoid and from the lesser wing of the sphenoid somewhere here the levator palpebri superioris is expanding up and nearly into the and the superior oblique is going towards its trochlea within the orbital plate of the frontal bone so the attachment of the levator palpebri superioris and the superior oblique are close together over here on the lesser wing of the sphenoid whereas below the origin of the inferior oblique is on the upper surface of the body of the maxilla in the floor of the orbit. So here you have a clearer picture of the beginning of all the extraocular muscles. Now these four rectus mus recti muscles and these obliques they are going to come anteriorly and get attached to the eyeball that is to the sclera of the eyeball after piercing the fascia bulbi. So here you can see these extraocular muscles coming at anteriorly and gaining their attachment. Here you can see the superior rectus, here you can see lateral rectus, here you can see inferior rectus and you can see the superior oblique taking a bend from the pulley and getting attached at this point inferior oblique curling below the eyeball and getting attached over here. So you see if this somewhere here you have the equator of the eyeball the recti muscles are attached between the sclerocorneal junction and the equator. So between the limbus and the equator is the attachment of the four recti muscles of the eyeball something around 5 to 7 millimeters behind the sclerocorneal junction. So all these four recti muscles are attached around 5 to 7 millimeters behind the sclerocorneal junction but these two obliques are attached to the posterior superior quadrant of the eyeball behind the equator of the eyeball. So this is the two obliques are attached much posteriorly and the four recti are attached anteriorly between the sclerocorneal junction and the equator of the eyeball about 5 to 7 millimeters behind the sclerocorneal junction. Now if you look at this picture again you can see the recti muscles and the obliques of the eyeball you just can't see the medial rectus because this is a lateral view now here because we have cut out a little bit of the lateral rectus through the lateral rectus you can see a little bit of the medial rectus not only that you can make out that this levator palpebri superior is anteriorly it is partly fleshy but mostly it ends in a fibrous broad fibrous lamina that is the aponeurosis of the levator palpebri superior is so this levator palpebri superior is when it comes anteriorly it splits into several strands. Anteriorly the one strand blends with the subcutaneous tissues of the eyelid and blends with the orbicularis oculi muscle. The intermediate strand which is fibrous and which is the main aponeurosis of the levator palpebri superior is it gets attached to the upper margin of the superior tarsus or the tarsal plate of the eyelid and a deeper lamina it gets attached to the conjunctival fornix. Now within this deeper lamina or the deeper part of the levator palpebri superioris there are a few muscles which are involuntary and supplied by the sympathetic nerve. So a deeper lamina of the levator palpebri superioris is actually involuntary in nature and the major part of the levator palpebri superioris is voluntary in nature. And you can also make out that the superior oblique after curving around its pulley it is attached 
below the superior rectus. So the levator palpebri superioris is attached below the superior rectus to the posterior superior quadrant of the eyeball, whereas the inferior oblique, the superior oblique passes in the direction, whereas the inferior oblique it passes around the eyeball below the inferior rectus. So it passes below inferior rectus and deep to the lateral rectus. So this you must keep in mind that the superior oblique passes deep to the superior rectus, inferior oblique passes below the inferior rectus and deep to the lateral rectus. So this diagram will help you to understand the course of the superior oblique muscle and the course of the inferior oblique muscle within the orbit. Now here you can see the levator palpebri superioris, part of it going into the eyelids into the subcutaneous tissue of the eyelids, into the orbicularis oculi, part of it expanding as a fibrous lamina into the superior tarsal plate, part of it going to the conjunctival fornix and holding it up. But on a deeper plane in the levator palpebri superioris, you do have some involuntary muscles. Now the movements of the eyeball. In movements of the eyeball, you can see this is elevation and depression, so around a horizontal axis, you are going to have elevation and depression and you can see around a vertical axis you are going to have adduction and abduction. So around a horizontal axis you are going to have elevations and depressions. Around a vertical axis you are going to have adduction and abduction and there is another movement of the eyeball which is called intorsion and in extorsion that is a spinning movement of the eyeball. That is actually the movement of the 12 o'clock portion of the eyeball. So if on the sclera and cornea, you fix up a 12 o'clock point, the inward movement of the 12 o'clock point will be intorsion and the outward movement will be extorsion. So inward twisting of the eyeball is intorsion, outward twisting of the eyeball is extorsion. Now next we are going to consider the movements of the extraocular muscles. And we are going to see that all of these movements are produced by which muscles? Some movements are produced by a single muscle and some movements are composite in nature, produced by more than one muscle. So let us take a look. But before that here again in this very well uh, illustrated and colorful diagram again you can see the attachments of the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. And you can make out that the inferior oblique passes below the inferior rectus and deep to the lateral rectus whereas the superior oblique passes below the superior rectus. And here although you have the directions of movement, superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus and lateral rectus and the twisting movements of the superior oblique and the inferior oblique, all these movements are better understood by a schematic. Now in this diagram you have the tentative directions of the attachment of the muscle. So superior rectus is attached in this direction Superior oblique is more or less attached in this direction, inferior rectus in this direction, inferior oblique in this direction. So these are directional attachments of the six extraocular muscles. The seventh one, levator palpebri superioris, it does not directly move the eyeball. So we are not bothered with that right now. We are mostly confined to the six extraocular muscles which actually move the eyeball. Now even in this picture you cannot be very confident about the movements and the muscles carrying out the movement unless you have a schematic like this. Now this is the standard diagram of movements caused by the extraocular muscle and this diagram of the action of the extraocular muscles you must keep in mind, you must memorize and if you get a question on the action of the extraocular muscles, this is not more, or more a question of anatomy, it's more a question of physiology. Even then if you get a question on the action of the extraocular muscles, you have to draw this diagram. And in this diagram you can see that the, a single muscle has more than one movement in most cases and a single movement is performed by more than one muscle. The only thing is that medial rectus and lateral rectus are clear cut. Medial rectus for adduction, lateral rectus for abduction. But all the other movements are complicated you find that elevation is both by superior rectus and inferior oblique. Depression is both by inferior rectus and superior oblique. Now this adduction, apart from medial rectus, superior rectus is also an adductor. Inferior rectus is also an adductor. For abduction, apart from lateral rectus, inferior oblique is also an abductor. Superior oblique is also an abductor. 
now the final movements of intorsion and extorsion the spinning movement of the eyeball you can see the superior oblique twist the eyeball in this direction so it is intorsion inferior extra twist it in this direction so it is extorsion inferior oblique twist it in this direction so it is extorsion and superior oblique twist the eyeball in this direction so it is intorsion so by and large you can make out that this movement would be intorsion so a clockwise movement as seen from the front would be intorsion and an anti clockwise movement as seen from the front would be extorsion for the right eye so for the left eye it would be different but all these are for the right eye now you see if you take these muscles individually superior rectus is an elevator it's an adapter and it's responsible for intorsion inferior rectus is a depression adduction extorsion superior oblique again you can see it is written here it's a depressor it's an abductor it's intorsion again inferior oblique it's an elevator it's an abductor it's responsible for extorsion now regarding extorsion and intorsion one of my friends who is no longer in anatomy now she is actually a uh, teacher of gynecology but she was a very good anatomy student and a very good anatomy teacher she once told me a very good way of memorizing which muscles perform intorsion and which muscles perform extorsion she used to tell me that superior people never extort so superior rectus and superior oblique they will always perform an intorsion and inferior people are always trying for extortion they are trying to extort money by unfair means so all the inferior people are extorters so inferior rectus is an extorter inferior oblique is an extorter so this is the way i have tried to remember them till today now knowing the movements and memorizing them is very good. but when you are going to test these movements then the problem arises how are you going to test these movements these are composite movements so how can you split these movements and test these movements one by one we will come to that later in a clinical diagram so this is one schematic you have to memorize and there is another clinical testing schematic which you also have to memorize but before that we will see a little bit the direction of attachment of these muscles so you can make out over here the superior rectus is in this direction so when the superior rectus contracts it will try to twist the eyeball in this direction that is this that is why the superior rectus causes adduction so you see here the superior rectus causes adduction if you only remember the line of attachment of the superior rectus when it is contracts it is going to pull the eyeball in this direction so it is not only trying to elevate the eyeball it is also trying to adduct the eyeball and it is trying to spin the eyeball in this direction so it is actually trying to twist it in this direction that is why it is an intorsion that's an inward movement of this eyeball so again you see here the superior rectus it is causing an inward movement so similarly again if you look at inferior rectus you will find the inferior rectus also attempts to pull the eyeball medially so although the inferior rectus is a depressor of the eyeball it is also an adductor of the eyeball whereas if you look at the superior oblique over here the superior oblique when it contracts because it is attached to this posterior superior quadrant of the eyeball when it contracts it will try to always abduct the eyeball so the superior and inferior obliques which are attached at this region when they contract they will try to abduct the eyeball that is why the superior and inferior obliques are both abductors if you only look at the direction of their attachment you can make out why they are abductors because the superior oblique is not acting from its origin here it is acting from the point of the pulley so superior oblique and inferior oblique both are abductors of the eyeball and superior oblique is a depressor of the eyeball inferior eye oblique is an elevator of the eyeball so what i am trying to say is if you look at the actual dissection of the orbit and the direction of attachment of the muscles then all these actions of the muscles will be immediately clear although it is not very easy to remember them immediately and spit it out instantly if someone asks you even i get confused sometimes so all of these muscle actions plus right eye left eye this direction that direction it is not very easy to give instantaneous answer so you must take your time you must try to draw this diagram from memory and you must try to recollect 
the attachments of the extraocular muscles and then you must try to back calculate in which directions these muscles are going to pull. So we have been looking at this diagram of the action of the extraocular muscles and I have told you that you have to commit this to memory and then you have to study this to look at the orientation of the extraocular muscles and calculate or estimate the directions of their pull and the composite action of some of these muscles. Now this here is another diagram which you have to keep in mind that is the clinical testing of the eye muscles. Again considering the right eye you see if you from the neutral position if you tell the patient to look in this direction this adduction is the property of medial rectus abduction is the property of lateral rectus so pure abduction and adduction lateral rectus and medial rectus now you will say that sir in adduction you also have the superior and inferior rectus they are also adductors and the superior and inferior obliques they are also abductors so why only medial rectus it is because although the superior and inferior rectus they are additional adductors they are poor adductors, they are weak adductors, they do not have much of a mechanical advantage so that if the medial rectus is paralyzed then definitely the adduction movement of the eyeball will also be considerably weakened. Now the superior and inferior rectus although they are also adductors they are not having much of a mechanical advantage. Why? If you look at this diagram you will see that this is the orbital axis that is from the apex to the base of the eye to the of the apex to the base of the orbit so from apex of the orbit to the base of the eye orbit this is the orbital axis and this is the antero posterior axis of the eye wall so these superior and inferior recti they are at an angle from the antero posterior axis of the eye wall and because they are at such a short angle they do not have much of a mechanical advantage and that is the reason why although superior and inferior rectus they are also adductors According to this diagram, if the superior rectus is an adductor, inferior rectus is also an adductor, but they don't have much of a mechanical advantage. That is why the principal adductor is always the medial rectus, and it is much more powerful adductor than the superior and inferior recti combined. Similarly, the superior and inferior obliques are abductors, but they are much less powerful abductors than the lateral rectus itself. Because the angle between the superior and inferior obliques and the anterior posterior axis of the eyeball is also not giving them much of a mechanical advantage. So that is why the adduction is the main real rectus and adduction is the main property of the lateral rectus. Again going to this So adduction by medial rectus, abduction is tested for the lateral rectus. So if you test these two movements then you can understand the health of these two muscles. Now the problem is elevation and depression. Now elevation of the eyeball can be performed equally well by both superior rectus and inferior oblique and depression of the eyeball can be performed inferior, uh, equally well by the inferior rectus and the superior oblique. So these two are almost equal in elevation of the eyeball and these two are almost equal in depression of the eyeball. So how are you going to separate the actions of these two muscles? This is done by adduction and elevation. Now suppose if you do abduction and elevation, in the abducted position, superior rectus is sole elevator. Why? Because in the abducted position, this inferior rectus will be only. Now if you look at this, if the eye ball is abducted to this position like this, it moves in this direction, then the eyeball will actually be in line with the superior rectus. So the superior rectus will be a very powerful elevator of the eyeball. On the other hand, if the eyeball shifts in this direction, the superior and inferior oblique, now the inferior oblique you cannot see, it has not been drawn, but from below it comes down deep to the lateral rectus somewhere here. So this is inferior oblique and this is superior oblique. Now if the eyeball is abducted, the superior and inferior obliques will become slightly lax. So they will not be performing efficiently as either elevators or depressors. So in the abducted position, superior rectus is the chief elevator of the eyeball and inferior rectus is the chief depressor. So abduction and elevation is mainly by superior rectus, abduction and depression is mainly by inferior rectus.
again if you look at this this diagram abduction and elevation by superior rectus abduction and superior rectus on the other if you do an abduction if you do an abduction then the line of the obliques is strengthened and the line of the recti muscles the superior and inferior recti it is weakened let us see what happens in adduction if you pull the eyeball in this direction if you pull it in this direction then the superior rectus will be in a much more advantageous position to depress the eyeball and the inferior the inferior or superior oblique rather the superior oblique will be in a much better position to depress the eyeball from here and the inferior oblique will be in a much better position to elevate the eyeball from here if the eyeball is shifted medially so if there is adduction in the most adducted position superior oblique is a very efficient depressor of the eyeball and in the adducted position the inferior oblique is a very efficient elevator of the eyeball so to separate these movements if you do adduction and elevation you are testing purely inferior oblique if you do adduction and depression you are testing mainly superior oblique if you do abduction and elevation you are testing superior rectus if you do abduction and depression you are testing mainly inferior rectus if you do a pure adduction you are mainly testing medial rectus if you do a pure uh, abduction you are testing mainly the lateral rectus so now more or less you have managed to separate the movement and test individual muscles in this diagram you had a composite of many movements you had not separated the movements but all the components were being studied together but in this clinical diagram you have managed to separate the movement according to the lines of attachment of these extraocular muscles so we will not go into much more of this we are not here to study ophthalmology let's go to the next diagram now this diagram we have included just to show you the optic nerve so you have the optic nerve here and you have the dural sheath of the optic nerve the pia mater and the arachnoid mater as well as the dura mater in fact you have all three meninges covering the optic nerve so the optic nerve as an extension of the brain it's a tract of fibers connecting the retina to the diencephalon so you have all the meningeal layers covering the optic nerve the dura arachnoid and the pia so that the dura mater is continuous with the sclera and the pia and arachnoid are continuous with the choroid and the optic nerve itself is continuous with the retina now if you look at this optic nerve you can make out there is a part of it within the orbit there is a part of it within the optic canal and there is a part of it within the anterior cranial fossa uh, not the, uh, it is not not the anterior cranial fossa just it's from the anterior to the middle cranial fossa extending from the uh, optic nerve up to the optic chiasma so this point is the optic chiasma so from the optic canal to the optic chiasma this is the intracranial part of the optic nerve so orbital part of the optic nerve intracanalicular part of the optic nerve intracranial part of the optic nerve now traditionally the entire length of the optic nerve is supposed to be 40 mm or 4 cm of which you have 25 cm for the orbital part 5 cm for the intracanalicular part and 10 cm for the intracranial part here the measurements are slightly different but anyway more or less this is the measurement that is 25 5 and 10 mm so you have a total of 40 mm or 4 cm for the length of the optic nerve from the optic disc to the optic chiasma what else you can make out is that this optic nerve is crossed from lateral to medial by the ophthalmic artery but again you know that it is also crossed from lateral to medial by the nasociliary nerve and it is crossed from lateral to medial or rather medial to lateral by the superior ophthalmic vein so on top on the upper surface of the optic nerve you have these three structures ophthalmic artery nasociliary nerve and superior ophthalmic vein through the substance of the optic nerve you have the pores of the central artery of the retina and the central vein of the retina now towards the apex of the orbit the optic nerve is surrounded by the fat of the orbit and between the orbit and the between the optic nerve and the lateral rectus over here on the lateral wall of the orbit you have the lateral rectus between the optic nerve and the lateral rectus somewhere here you have the ciliary ganglion and underneath the optic nerve you have the passage of the branch of the lower division of the oculomotor nerve which is going to the medial rectus so the optic nerve apart from all this is covered from the optic canal by the cone of attachment of the 
four recti muscles. So the recti muscles are surrounding the optic nerve above, below and on the two sides from the emergence of the optic nerve into the orbit right up to the posterior pole of the eye. So more or less these are the relations of the optic nerve. So to study this optic nerve I have included this diagram. Now let's go on. Now this is an interesting diagram from an old edition of Gray's Anatomy. In this schematic you can see the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular divisions. And from the ophthalmic division you have the frontal nerve, you have this nasociliary nerve and you have the cut out lacrimal nerve. This is the lacrimal nerve that is cut and you can see the rest of the lacrimal nerve and you can see the frontal nerve dividing into supraorbital and supratrochlear and you can see the nasociliary nerve crossing over the optic nerve from lateral to medial and you can see the nasociliary nerve supporting the ciliary ganglion over here and giving the short ciliary nerves and the nasociliary nerve itself providing the long ciliary nerves and over here from the nasociliary nerve you can see the anterior ethmoidal nerve over here and somewhere here is the posterior ethmoidal nerve again now that you have come to the ciliary ganglion see this is the oculomotor nerve and you have a superior division of the oculomotor nerve and you have an inferior division of the oculomotor nerve the upper division is here this is the upper division of the oculomotor nerve supplying the superior rectus and the levator palpebris superioris this is the lower division of the oculomotor nerve and this lower division of the oculomotor nerve supplies the inferior rectus the inferior oblique and the medial rectus now from the nerve inferior oblique you have the connecting fibers of the oculomotor nerve going to the ciliary ganglion supplying parasympathetic fibers apart from that this is the lateral rectus which is cut and reflected to the side and you can see the abducent nerve you can see the abducent nerve over here because it is very slender and it is covered by the oculomotor nerve but over here you can see the abducent nerve supplying the lateral rectus apart from them over here you have the slender trochlear nerve which is going to go to the superior oblique muscle you can't follow the superior oblique muscle in this tense portion anyway but you can see a lot in this diagram and what you can make out is that over here from the maxillary division of the nerve, zygomatic nerve and from this maxillary division was hanging the pterygopalatine ganglion from the pterygopalatine ganglion efferent parasympathetic fibers were going through the zygomatic branch of the maxillary nerve zygomatic or temporal nerve and a loop of covering uh, a loop of connection with the lacrimal nerve so you see the zygomatic or temporal nerve carries the parasympathetic fibers from pterygopalatine ganglion and joins with the lacrimal nerve and supplies the secretomotor fibers to the lacrimal gland. Now if we look at another picture, this is another picture, you have already seen this picture in the sense that this is a dissection of the orbit which we have seen previously. I have just shown you once again to re-emphasize how we dissect the orbit and to recapitulate once you have removed the roof of the orbit and you have removed the orbit periosum, you can see the front nerve you can see lacrimal nerve over here these ones you can see and you can see the trochlear nerve so the lacrimal nerve frontal nerve and trochlear nerve lacrimal frontal and trochlear you recall are the three nerves passing through the lateral part of the superior orbital fissure so lacrimal nerve over here frontal nerve dividing into supraorbital supratrochlear and trochlear nerve over here going to the superior oblique so initially when you de-roof the orbit and remove the orbital periosteum you can see this picture and then again you have to remove the superior oblique the, the levator palpebri superior is sorry and the superior rectus these two muscles when you have cut out you can see the remaining nerves that is you can see the nasociliary nerve over here and you can see the abducens nerve so initially you could see the lacrimal frontal and trochlear nerve and when you have cut and reflected the superior oblique uh, the, uh, always making a mistake the superior and levator palpebri superior is then you can see the nasociliary nerve and the optic going as the and posterior ethmoidal nerves and the nasociliary nerve supporting the ciliary ganglion giving short ciliary nerves direct from the nasociliary the long ciliary nerves. So this is that same dissection of the orbit that we were looking at previously. Let us look at another picture. In this picture again we are highlighting on this trigeminal nerve that is frontal division of the trigeminal nerve. So ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. So this is trigeminal nerve, ophthalmic, maxillary, mandibular divisions. And from the ophthalmic division you have the ciliary ganglion. From the maxillary division you have the pterygopalatine ganglion. 
and if you recall in the mandibular division you have the submandibular ganglion and the otic ganglion so two ganglion along the mandibular nerve and one ganglia each along the ophthalmic and one along the maxillary nerve so this is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve which is separated into a lacrimal nerve over here going to the lacrimal gland a frontal nerve over here splitting into supraorbital and supratrochlear and a nasociliary nerve over here crossing the optic nerve from lateral to medial again for this lacrimal nerve you can see the loop of communication with the zygomatic temporal nerve which is coming from the zygomatic branch of the maxillary nerve and it is relaying fibers from the pterygopalatine ganglion so pterygopalatine ganglion parasympathetic secretomotor fibers back to the maxillary nerve zygomatic branch zygomatic temporal loop communicating with the lacrimal nerve and on to the lacrimal gland again the nasociliary nerve crossing over giving connect supporting the ciliary ganglion and giving the short ciliary nerve directly from the nasociliary you have the long ciliary nerves and the other branches of the nasociliary nerves which we were just mentioning now you come to this diagram in this diagram again there is nothing new to be seen but this is a new view actually the more different views you get of the orbit the better it is for you now in this diagram again the oculomotor nerve you have the upper division of the oculomotor nerve here you have the lower division of the oculomotor nerve here upper division supplying the superior rectus and the levator palpebris superioris lower division supplying the inferior rectus inferior oblique and the medial rectus and you can see the nerve to medial rectus crossing under the optic nerve and the nasociliary nerve which was crossing above the optic nerve so right here you cannot see the nasociliary nerve you can see the superior division of the oculomotor nerve so superior division over here and make out the oblique you have the secretomotor fibers being relayed to the ciliary ganglion so from the nerve to inferior oblique you have the secretomotor fibers to the ciliary ganglion so oculomotor nerve with the upper and lower divisions you have the abducens now coming here and supplying the lateral rectus like this and the trochlear nerve going up and supplying the superior oblique so you can see trochlear nerve to superior oblique abducens nerve to lateral rectus and oculomotor nerve to the other extra ocular muscles now we come to this diagram in this diagram again it is a schematic for the nerve supply of the extra ocular muscles from the oculomotor nucleus upper division two muscles lower division three muscles from the trochlear nucleus so4 and from the abducens nucleus star6 now here you have a diagram of the ophthalmic artery we have been neglecting the ophthalmic artery for so long we have only been looking at the nasociliary nerve crossing the optic nerve but you must keep in mind that the ophthalmic artery is also crossing the optic nerve from lateral to medial and when it is crossing the optic nerve from lateral to medial it is crossing from below from underneath the optic nerve it takes the lateral surface then crosses over here it is the central artery of the retina which goes along pierces the dura sheath pierces the meninges surrounding the optic nerve and goes into the substance of the optic nerve as the central artery of the retina and you can make out that this this ophthalmic artery it gives some branches along the medial wall of the orbit and some branches along the lateral wall of the orbit if you consider the branches along the lateral wall you have this lacrimal artery and this lacrimal artery can in meningeal branch you see meningeal artery has gives one anti branch and the branch of lacrimal artery has to meningeal artery then it gives the zygomatic facial and zygomatic temporal branches from the zygomatic artery and this lacrimal artery it goes anteriorly to give the anterior ciliary artery by supplying the anterior part of the extraocular muscles and again this ciliary artery crosses over the optic nerve and it gives the supraorbital and supratrochlear artery close to the medial wall of the orbit and anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries as well as long and long and short posterior ciliary arteries long and short posterior ciliary arteries lacrimal artery zygomatic artery anterior ciliary arteries supraorbital artery supratrochlear artery anterior and posterior ethmoidal artery long and short posterior ciliary arteries and the central artery of the retina the of the ophthalmic artery now in this diagram you can make out how the central artery of the retina is going through the optic nerve at the optic disc can ramifying in the retina to give the different nasal and temporal branches in the different quadrants of the retina and this is supplemented by other arteries passing along the optic nerve that is the long and short posterior ciliary arteries and anteriorly the anterior ciliary arteries so this is a schematic of the arterial supply of the eyeball but let us see what else is there in the orbit now here in the orbit you have the 
venous drainage of the orbit. In this venous drainage, you can see the veins of the orbit collect into a superior ophthalmic vein and they collect into an inferior ophthalmic vein. The veins of the orbit more or less follow the branches of the ophthalmic artery. But you know the venous branch uh, the venous tributaries are much more variable and unpredictable compared to the branches of the artery. So the small venue veins above the eyeball they coalesce to form the superior ophthalmic vein and the veins below the eyeball they collect together to form the inferior ophthalmic vein. Now the superior ophthalmic vein over here it, through the dorsal nasal vein it communicates with the angular vein which is the beginning of the facial vein. So the facial vein communicates with the veins of the orbit to the superior ophthalmic vein over here and also through the inferior ophthalmic vein. So the facial vein has communications with the ophthalmic veins and because the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins both drain into the canus sinus, so infections from the danger area of the face through the ophthalmic vein travel into the cavernous sinus. Apart from that you can see that the inferior ophthalmic vein through the inferior orbital fissure over here. This is the inferior orbital fissure, this is the superior orbital fissure. So through the superior orbital fissure you have both the superior ophthalmic vein and a part of the inferior ophthalmic vein and through the inferior orbital fissure you have another part of the inferior ophthalmic vein. So this inferior ophthalmic vein it communicates through the inferior orbital fissure with the pterygoid venous flexors and again the pterygoid venous flexors communicates by the transverse facial vessels with the facial vein. So facial vein has a communication with the veins of the orbit, the cavernous sinus and the pterygoid venous flexors all round. Superior ophthalmic vein to cavernous sinus, inferior ophthalmic vein to cavernous sinus as well as to the pterygoid venous flexors. From the pterygoid flexors again transverse facial vein connecting it to the that is why you see infections in the day of the face can be truly dangerous. They can travel along the uh, transverse facial veins over here and go to the pterygoid venous flexors. They can travel up through the ophthalmic veins, the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins and they can go to the cavernous sinus. So I think we have studied a lot about the orbit, may not everything, but may not be we have studied, it may be that we have not studied everything, but then we have covered a considerable amount of ground and I think uh, you must be exhausted as much as I am after this discourse and you need to sit with your books and go through all these pictures meticulously and see what else is in your books, how your books have presented the anatomy of the orbit and then compare with what I have said in this video. Thank you.